I am so glad we have a full house. Um, and for those of you who are coming in, don't be shy. We've got seats up front, and you really want to hear this speaker. So um, for me, um, today is educational. Um, we are a Hispanic-serving institution. And um, our speaker today, um, her dissertation topic was challenging the manufactured identity of Hispanic serving institutions. Co-constructing an organizational identity looked at the uh, uh, organizational identity, identity of HSIs and the ways in which the, this identity goes beyond the label assigned by the federal government. So um, you can see, for those of you who don't understand why we're having this series, it's because we are an HSI. And I want you to raise your hand if you understand what that means and how we got that designation. Good. So what does it mean? Shout something out. Shout something out. What else does it mean beyond the enrollment numbers? OK, we can get funding. Beyond the fact that we have enrollment and we have funding that's tied to enrollment, what does it mean? Ah, oh, we're getting there. Good. Um, so um, for those of you who are like me, because the shout outs got a lot lighter um, as I asked the other questions. Um, so I knew the enrollment information, knew the, the, the financial aid implications or the, the grant implications. But it really is much more than that. And how many of you, this is another test, have seen the position paper coming from the Latin American studies, Latina, La Latin American? OK, not enough, but enough, but a lot, not enough. So from that position paper and read, beginning to read, and when I was preparing for this job, I was like, what does it mean to be a Hispanic-serving institution? Um, those of us who come from the African-American culture know what an HBCU is. Um, those who have been grown familiar with tribal colleges and tribal universities understand the origin of that. But what we, we don't have is a real definition and a real concrete foundational understanding of what an HSI is. And that's what this lecture series is about. And we couldn't have a better person to kick it off than somebody whose body of scholarly work is designed to help us answer those questions. Um, so I'm excited to introduce um, Gina Garcia, who is has her PhD from UCLA. And uh, we one of my mentors and best friends and big brother is a, was a, she knows from UCLA, and she learned under him as well. Um, but she's now at the University of Pittsburgh. And it is so important for us to understand what it means to be a Hispanic-serving institution, because it is not just about enrollment. Um, and as when we had this conversation last week in the leadership meeting, and she may not want me to say it, but one of the folks in our meeting reframed how I approached this question. And what she said was, it's not that our enrollment numbers are at now 47%. The question is, they chose us, and they chose to make us an HSI. They chose us. So what is our responsibility? Because they chose us, and they gave us this designation. And so Gina is going to help us unpack that. Aren't you? So please join me in welcoming Gina. Um, thank you very much. Where did she go? Oh, thank you very much. Thank you all for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited to see the room full. Um, I'm so excited to talk about HSIs because this is like my life's work. So I could talk about HSIs for the rest of the afternoon. If you're interested, you know, we can just keep going. I know probably y'all have to go like to class, teach classes, or go to class. Um, so I won't, but um, I definitely am excited to be here, and, and I will share as much as I can with you about exactly um, what I'm here to do, which is is talk about how being an HSI is really super complex, right? I've spent some time with folks here already, and, and that's where y'all are exactly where most people are. We don't really know what this means beyond having 25% or more, like almost 50%, right? Uh, Latinx students, right? So we're not really sure what this means. Help us understand what do you think it means. Um, and so I spent a lot of time helping institutions to understand that it's much more than the designation um, and that it's your identity, right? So if you leave here thinking about anything, think about that, that this is your identity, right? And the best way to sort of think about that is like think about racial identities, right? And we all, some of us have similar racial or ethnic identities, but it doesn't mean we're the same. 
right? We all define that in different ways, right? And Latinos are, are, I mean, we're super complex people, super duper complex people. So HSIs are similarly super complex and they don't just look like one thing, right? So we can't expect HSIs to look the same, just like we don't expect our students to look the same, even if they have similar racial backgrounds, right? So keep that in mind. Um, what else did I want to say? Um, I wanted to say that, oh, I know anytime anybody mentions I'm from the University of Pittsburgh, I always, I put my hair down, my head down. Um, University of Pittsburgh is like the whitest institution ever. Some of y'all shaking your head, you're like, yeah, University of Pittsburgh. So why are you writing about HSIs and you're at the whitest institution ever, right? So I always like to give my positionality, which is, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a qualitative researcher. I do some quant work as well. I'm a mixed methods researcher, but I'm a qualitative researcher and qualitative researchers, we tell you where we're coming from, right? Because we are the tool of research, right? So we, we understand the world through our lens, right? Um, and so I like to tell you my positionality. So I am a product of an HSI. I went to an HSI as an undergrad. I went to Cal State University, Northridge. Um, and I didn't know it was an HSI at the time. Um, and at the time, it was actually an emerging HSI. Um, it's been now become and has been for quite some time an HSI. Um, but I didn't understand what that meant. Um, but I do know that the experience I had was transformative. Right? It, it meant something for me. And it meant something for me as a person of color. It meant something for me as a Chicana. Right, I didn't I didn't identify as a Chicana until I went to college, right? And that was because the experience I had there and the curriculum, right? We'll talk about curriculum a lot. We've been talking about curriculum that I had allowed me to understand what that actually meant, right? Chicana is a very um, political, uh, racial, ethnic term, right? And and it, and not a lot of people identify with that term, um, but I I do because I understand what it means, right? But I understand what that means because I sat in classes with like Rudy Acuna, who's like the godfather of Chicano studies, and and understood it through his. Perspective perspective, right? And and what a privilege that was. I didn't know at the time. I just was like, I don't know who Rudy Acuna is, but this is class. It's always full. And I got in, so I'm taking it, right? And so it was an, it was a great class. Um, and I didn't come to appreciate it really till later, right? And some of your students won't come to appreciate the experience that you give them until later. And that's okay, right? That's okay. Um, because I still say that that experience did matter. Even if I didn't know it was an HSI, it still mattered. So that's my positionality. I worked for an, H at an HSI for four years. I worked with the Title V grant. Um, and that's when I started being really critical of HSIs. I was like, why do we have this grant? We don't even know what this means. You just get like $2 million and then you don't even know what to do with the money, right? Like, why did you hire me? I just got a master's degree. I don't, I don't know what to do with this, right? I just come straight out of my master's program. I'm like, I have no idea, right? Somebody should be telling me what to do. I don't know what it means to be an HSI, right? And I started being very critical because I was like, you just get this grant money, but you don't actually know what you're doing, right? Um, and so then I, I went into this work as I started doing research with HSIs with those two lenses. Like, yes, they're good, but yes, they're complicated. And yes, we don't know what we're doing, right? So all of those things are wrapped up. In, in my um, ways of thinking about HSIs, right? That like good, but also we got we got to work harder, right? We got to do the work if we really want HSIs to um, to be good spaces for people, right? Intentional spaces for people. So that's where the title of the talk comes from. So the title of my talk is Decolonizing Hispanic Serving Institutions, and I'm going to talk about uh, these, this sort of large theoretical idea of decolonization um, and what that means at a really much more practical level um, for HSI. So, uh, oh, by the way, if you want to follow me on Twitter, there's my Twitter, hand, Twitter handle, um, Gina Ann Garcia, feel free to, to um, follow me on Twitter um, if you want. And so do we have a clicker now, or are you going to click it? Okay, yeah, go ahead, click it. No, just go through the presentation like naturally, because isn't it in presentation form? Yeah, That's, it goes there, go back, go back, go back, go back. It should go to first the recognition of land, right? It doesn't go there. That should be the first like bubble, right? All right, so we'll start there. So I do recognize land because I'm talking about decolonizing, right, and decolonization. So I always recognize land, recognize that we are on colonized land, right? And that's sort of the crux of this idea of decolonizing is that before we can decolonize and before we can get to being anti-racist or anti-oppressive, we have to actually recognize that those structures exist, right? So this idea of coloniality and the U.S. being colonized territory matters, right? We are on colonized lands, right? So if you 
come to that basic you know, understanding and recognize that that's real, right? And most native folks have been basically eliminated, right, from this country because of colonization, um, that, 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 that's where I'm starting from, right? Well, if we think about decolonizing an entire institution, we have to be at that basic level, right? That, that we understand oppression exists and colonization exists, right? And it's wiped out people's ways of knowing and being for centuries, right? We've been doing this in the US territory for a long time. So recognition of the land is always um, um, first slide that I start with. All right, next, next slide. Um, so HSIs, let's just start. Y'all have a pretty good understanding of HSIs, but let me just give you a little, you know, quick little HSI 101 um, if we can get to the next bubble. So HSIs, yes, 25%. You have to have at least 25%. This is a map of um, one of the most recent maps from Excellencia in Education. If y'all want to know what it means to be an HSI, start there. If you don't know Excellencia in Education's work, they do great policy work, right? And they just got basic knowledge, right? You can, they'll, you can get basic knowledge about HSIs from Excellencia in Education. And also, how to serve Latinx students. So start there, Excellency in Education. That comes from um, Excellency in Education. But they, in their last round of reporting, every year they report the number of HSIs. They told us there were 14% 14, 14 of all post-secondary institutions were HSIs. This number increases, I would say, about a percent every year. When I first started thinking about HSIs, it was about 6%, right? And it's now 14%. So I don't call HSIs HSIs or emerging HSIs. I say all institutions are going to be HSIs, all right? Because the population is here and we're not going anywhere, right? We are multiplying. We multiply quickly. We, meaning Latino people, we multiply, right? We don't necessarily immigrate, all right? So the man in power in D.C., he has no idea because we will keep multiplying even if the walls build all the way around the whole country. We're still going to be here, right? So HSIs are still going to be a thing, right? Because we multiply. So, so birth rates are a real thing, right? So the population is growing. We know that. And so we're now seeing that reflected in our, in our institutions, right? I love walking in the hall. I was like, oh, Oh, this is a great institution, and not my institution at all, because I'm at the whitest institution ever, right? Because I just see so many black and brown faces in the halls, and I just love it, right? So this is what institutions are gonna look like, right? But the problem is we know at our core, at our structures, we, we're not really sure what that means yet. So 64% of all Latino students go to um, HSIs, right? All right, next, next slide. Um, so Hispanic servant institutions, I think it's important for us to recognize the diversity, right? It goes back to my statement about we are, we can't think about one HSI identity. Everybody, what it means for everybody and for your institution is unique, right? And that's because the only unifying characteristic is the 25%, right? And nonprofit, that's the other one, right? So you have to be a nonprofit institution. For-profits are not eligible for federal funding at the moment. I say at the moment because hopefully they don't start to push towards that because it'll be kind of determined mental to HSIs, right? So right now, not, and that's a whole other talk, but nonprofit, you have to be nonprofit and 25%. Otherwise, there's no nothing unifying. They're big, they're small, they're rural, they're urban, they're, they're public, they're private, they're liberal arts, they're research universities, they're comprehensive, they're broad access, they're health focused, right? They're everything, right? They're religious focused, there's Catholic uh, HSIs. I mean, there's so many different types of HSIs that that's partially why we can't just operate from one sort of like identity, right? There has to be a lot of ways to think about this identity. Um, real quick, the next, if you click, I added this like, what does Latinx mean? Does anybody watch um, One Day at a Time? Raise your hand. Everybody, you, this, everybody should raise their hand, all right? Y'all assignment is to watch One Day at One, You want to be culturally relevant, watch One Day at a Time. What an amazing show about women, Latinas, and like just, they bring in so many complex things. So anyways, Rita Moreno, she's great. She talks about, uh, the, uh, in this first, the second season, um, the granddaughter is like very conscious and woke, and she talks about Latinx. I'm a proud Latinx. And she's like, Latinx, what's Latinx? like a Kleenex, right, Latinx, what the heck is it, right? And then the whole se episode, she's talking about Latinx, Kleenex, right? Um, what is this Latinx, right? It's not a really a word, really. Um, the X just sort of uh, indicates that it's ge that gender is fluid, right? We know that the Spanish language is very gendered, so it just is allowing for gender fluidity, fluidity, right? So feel free to use it, but also watch one day at a time, all right? Because they, they do some great plays on a lot of really important things in Latino culture right now, all right? So watch it, it's so good, you'll cry. All right, next term. So this is what I think HSIs look like. They're so complex, right? I'm just going to keep drilling home that like it, you, it, it's, what it means to be an HSI doesn't mean one thing, right? Because this is the diversity of HSIs, right? There's so many different types and flavors and colors and all these sorts of nutrients um, that come in different ways, right? So keep that in mind. 
But what we do know, go ahead, is that they don't have a unifying mission to serve Latinx students, right? That's the problem, is that we don't have this historical mission, and so that's why all HSIs are like, huh, what does this mean, right? How do we serve Latinx students? Because we just don't know, because there's never been this historical mission, right? So we need to figure this out, and that's the key. The HSI that figures that out is gonna be, like, have the magic, you know, qu the answer, the million dollar question, is like, how do you actually serve Latino students? So that's what y'all are gonna figure out, and then you're gonna have the answer to the million dollar question. All right, go through. All right, so I'd like to talk about the profile of students at HSIs. There's a, a lot of talk about like, well, it, it's not just a, it's not, not just Hispanic students or Latinx students, right? Because really, that identity brings a lot of other identities, right? So there's lots and lots of other types of things that you have to think about as a Latino or as a, an HSI or Latinx serving institution that like your students are low income. They maybe, right? Maybe low income. Maybe first generation of college. Maybe first generation of this country. Maybe undocumented. Maybe they weren't ready for college according to you know standardized tests which we know those are problematic and racist but maybe according to those they weren't ready right there's all sorts of different things that we have to think about that your students are much more complex than a race right or ethnicity right so that's what it means to be an HSI is that you are enrolling all these these students that have complexities right they're they're complex students so serving complex students is is complex right but keep all those all those sort of things in mind okay next one now what we know is that the faculty don't match the student population. This is a national problem. I have yet to find an HSI that matches the student population. I even worked with an institution that was historically an HSI. They're a bilingual institution, bilingual English, Spanish, and even they were behind. They were kind of behind. They, had, they still had a large white percentage of fac faculty was largely white. They, they were better, but uh, most institutions do not match, right? And so we know this, and this is highly problematic, right? And, and we gotta figure this one out. Nobody's figured this one out. How, to, how do you address the issue that the Latino population of faculty at, at HSIs is still about, and 15% is, that's being nice, I think, but this is what some of the recent literature says, that like it's about 15%, even at Hispanic serving community colleges in California, where let me tell you, there is a pipeline of faculty in California. There is this wonderful system called the University of California, which I graduated from. There are a lot, a lot of people that have PhDs that graduate from the University of California system. Why aren't they going into institutions, right? And so this pipeline issue, there's something going on, right? So HSI, to be an HSI means that you figure this out, right? You figure out how to tra transform your faculty because having faculty of color matters to students of color. It does. The literature says that, right? Different talk, but it says it. It matters. What your faculty look like matters. All right, next one. So. This one I put here, this one's kind of hard. To, this has a whole background. This is a whole study that I did. But focus here on this, on this category right here, right? So these are six institutions that I, that I worked with in, um, in Chicago, right? And, and you can see that this right here, these two were emerging HSIs at the time, but they're HSIs now. You can see the population. Look at this population is the one that I said that even they have, um, their faculty is, is still a lot of white faculty. This um, is the undergraduate population, but this is the graduate population, right? And so this this was really eye-opening for me. I was like, whoa, we're not talking about graduate students. Why aren't we talking about graduate students, right? So to be an HSI is only at your undergraduate level, but it's not at your graduate level, right? Which is connected to why we, are, we don't have faculty, right? Because you gotta have students in graduate programs that then go on to become faculty, whether it's master's or doctoral, you know, if they have those degrees, right? Because some, some institutions hire both, right? So we got, a, we got some, a, an issue to address here, right? And I didn't find y'all numbers because I ran out of time, but I would assume that your graduate population looks like this, right? That your percentage of undergrads is like 47%, but your graduate population, I can almost guarantee you is not 40%, 47% Latino, almost guaranteed. So your graduate students get into those classes and they're like, whoa, it's white, what happened, right? What happened? Because when they walk in the halls, that's not what they see, but they get in the classroom and that's what they see, right? That's what they see. So there's there's something for us to address, right, with, with that. And I haven't addressed that in the research yet, but we're gonna have to address that. So that's graduate students. Um, so what does it mean to be an HSI? There's bodies of literature that say it's outcomes based. This is the body of literature. If you wanna do research um, on HSIs, there's some of the people who are doing the work, right? And these folks basically in their research are like, well, if you produce equitable outcomes for students, then you're an HSI, right? So if you graduate Latino students in high numbers or in equitable numbers, you're an HSI, right? Okay, 
valid. We want students to graduate, right? Yes, right? There's also some that say, well, you know, HSIs and all those little plus signs mean that students um, that go to HSIs have higher um, indicators of like civic participation, racial identity salience, academic self-concept, and engagement. That's what the research is telling us, that students that go to HSIs have higher percentages of those things, right? So these are positive environments for Latino students, right? The pluses and the minuses on the academic one means that some researchers have found that HSIs have lower academic outcomes, or the same as non-HSIs, right? So it's really, the academic outcomes, it's really complex, and people are running advanced models to try to figure out what does it mean to have equitable outcomes um, for students. But this is one way to think about it, outcomes, that, that you're producing equitable outcomes. Now, the other side of the coin that I think about is culture, right? So some scholars, these are scholars who have written about culture, and they say that if you have a positive environment for students, then it will lead to outcomes, right? So if, if it's good, and if I come to campus and I don't experience microaggressions on a daily basis, I might actually graduate, right? But if I come to campus and I experience aggressions, not even micro sometimes, I might not come back, right? And I might leave and not ever graduate, right? So the culture and the environment that you create matters, right? If I feel validated in the classroom and I feel like my voice is heard or that I'm reading from perspectives that are mine, that I might stay and that I might actually excel and that I might go on to graduate school and I might go on to get a PhD and I might go on to become a professor one of these HSIs, right? All these sort of things, if the culture is right, right? And so these are some of the folks that say campus climate matters, cultural uh, campus culture matters, and also the practices that we have in the classroom and outside matter, right? That, that we need to have good, um, relevant practices. So that's the other side of it. So next slide is, so some of you are familiar with this typology that I propose of HSI identities. So in this typology, I'm like, well, Maybe it's both, right? Maybe you need to have high outcomes and maybe you need to have a good culture, right? And that would be this, this, what I call the Latinx serving box, right? Maybe we all want to be there. I don't know, but most institutions aren't here because even institutions that have high outcomes that like produce, um, you know, equitable um, graduation rates of Latino students, which y'all actually, when I get to your slides, I would say they're equitable. Um, I don't know if they're equitable with other institutions, but they're equitable across race. I don't know if y'all are familiar with that, but we'll, uh, we'll see that slide. Um, so if they're here, doesn't necessarily that mean that students are having this like cultural experience or what we talked about in our lunch today, like that they're not necessarily graduating with like critical consciousness and going out and changing the world, right? Which I think is a good outcome. I think HSI should do that, right? And so this is, that would be this. That is the organizational culture is centered on Latinx ways of knowing or minoritized ways of knowing. Institute Institutions aren't doing as good of a job necessarily in this, right? And then here means they're not doing any, they're not graduating students, no outcomes, outcomes are low, they're inequitable, and also the experience is um, race neutral, right? Then that would be in that corner. So there's different ways to be an HSI, but I think you can move, right? I think you can decide, you know what, we're gonna do both, right? And y'all I think are up at the opportunity to do both, right? If you want, if you wanna do that. Next slide. What's missing? So here, something I mentioned in the last slide was like faculty diversity, staff and administration diversity, and also graduate student enrollment. That's something that I don't account for here. I'm not really sure how to yet. That's why it's just there on the side, because I'm like, hmm, that's a problem, right? Like we need to figure out how to account for compositional diversity across all groups, right? So something to think about, but it's not it's not in the topology. It's not captured there, but we, we need to think about it. All right, next slide. Culturally relevant curriculum, what is this? Right, so I wrote this article about Chicano studies, right, at this, at this site that I did research at and, um, and talked about how the Chicano studies curriculum was um, not just in Chicano studies, right? That Chicano studies faculty, the, they were teaching classes that like were across the curriculum, right? And this is sort of a, a like interesting way to think, right? Because if we think about ethnic studies, ethnic studies is one department and they can't do all the work, right? And that's typically what we see is like ethnic studies programs do all the work, but they can't, right? There's only a handful of faculty and they can't do the work. So how do you make it so that the curriculum cuts across all, all? That, another million dollar question because I don't have the answer for that. But y'all have the opportunity I think at this moment, right now, this is your historical moment, to do that work and to think about how do you become relevant or anti-racist or anti-oppressive in your curriculum across the board, right? No matter where students, no matter what kind of class they're taking, they're getting it from this 
a revisionist, what I'll call a revisionist perspective, right? That other perspectives are coming into the classroom. And that's what I talk about in this article is like, how do you do that? How do you do that so that students experience this whether they take ethnic, ethnic studies classes or not, right? It can't just be the work of those folks in that, in that classroom. All right, next, next um, slide. So research on campus climate says that like if there's a positive or culturally engaging campus, it will lead to like sense of belonging, engagement, and academic outcomes. And then if we click on the next box, and then I expand it, expand it into like post-baccalaureate enrollment, job placement, like beyond, right? And I, not just graduating with them, but we gotta start thinking about beyond, right? What's, what comes next? But like this is all connected, right? And the research would tell us that like, yes, the culture matters, right? What we do have in a culturally engaging environment matters and is gonna lead to better outcomes. We have to truly believe that in order to do it. We're not gonna transform our environment until we truly believe that it leads to greater outcomes. And some of my colleagues have found that, right? That that is the case. It leads to greater outcomes for minoritized students, right? I see some people taking a picture. There's some of the citations. Museas does work on this area. Jaya Kumar, Hurtado, my, my advisor from UCLA, Sylvia Hurtado, she's been doing this work for a very long time, talking about campus climate and the importance of campus climate, right? And microclimates also, like that even if the climate, the, I call that the big C climate, the whole climate is good. What about the climate in um, STEM? I always pick on STEM, STEM, right? Is the climate good in chemistry, in the chemistry class, right? Because if it's not, then the whole climate isn't good, right? Your microclimates have to be good as well, right? So think about that as well. All right, I think we're going on to this idea of decolonization. All right, so why decolonize HSIs? So I have this, I wrote this article, and there's a whole, you know, the intro section I just talk about, why would we decolonize HSIs, right? What does this mean? It's a super theoretical idea, and also why should we do it, right? And so if you click on, the, uh, click on this, um, oh, that's just a citation, but go to the next one. Um, so I do this like his, like quick history. It's like shortest history ever in this article, right? That like the reason why we should is because academic outcomes for raza, and I call it, I use that term specifically in this article because I'm like, well, Latino is kind of a colonized term, right? Spanish is a colonized language, right? Like we really start thinking about col colonization, like all we gotta like pick apart like all those sorts of things, right? So I talk about like negative outcomes for people of color in general are related to other larger historical things, right? Like colonization, like slavery, right? We were like, why do black students just always at the bottom, right? Like every sort of academic outcome. Well, slavery, right? Historically, we didn't want black people to have an education, right? Like go, just look at the history, right? That was intentional. That was intentional by design that we don't want black folks to learn, right? And then it happened in natives, it happened to Latinos, it happens to all happen to minoritized groups, right? That the cu curriculum was designed to strip folks of all of their ways of knowing their knowledge, right? So when we ask why are they not excelling in the same rates as white students, that's why, right? And so that's really what I argue here. It's like, well, colonial education, that's what it's been designed to do. It created a racial caste system, and it created a system in which people got a colonized education, the education that was the colonizer's ways of knowing and being, right? Their language, their, their Christianity, that's always like colonial education was to Christianize, right? Like that was a movement to Christianize and strip people of their religious ways of knowing, right? So taking people of, um, what they, what they, what their ways of knowing are. Go ahead and go to the next one. Um, yeah, that's just more facts. I already talked about that. Go on to the next one. Let's see what else is here. Um, Oh, so my friend, Kati de los Rios, she writes a lot about this, about colonial education. So if you want to read about like curriculum and uh, how curriculum is used as a tool of colonization, she's one good person to look at. Um, but she talks about like this has traditionally been the way, right? And so something I want you to think about is when your students get here, that's all they've had for 12 years, right? K through 12 system is designed around a colonial education, right? So they get here and it's your opportunity to disrupt that. Right? But also recognize that that's all they've ever had. Right? That's all they've ever had. All they know is Christopher Columbus arrived in 1492. <laughs> right? We all know that. Right? Like, why do I know the year? Because we all know it. Right? We all know that. Right? We all know the colonial history. And we had to take it like three times. Why do we take the same colonizer's history three times? I don't know. Right? But going through K-12 through schools, that's what you get. Right? In the U.S., you get the colonized curriculum. So when your students get here and that's all they know, be gentle. Right? Be gentle with them. Know like, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, that ew, God, educational systems failed you. We understand. Now, for the next four years, we're going to empower you. Right? And we're going to liberate you. Imagine if that was your mission. Right? Is that you're like, yes, we understand that that's all you 
you've had, but we're, we're ready to empower you now. We're going to liberate you. We're going to give you the tools to understand that the curriculum you've had has been the colonizer's curriculum, right? And how do we give you the decolonized curriculum, right? An alternative curriculum or the decolon. I don't even call it alternative because it shouldn't be all the alternative. It's just the decolonized curriculum, right? It's not the colonial curriculum. So next slide. So this is what I argue is like, this is why we see inequitable outcomes for our Latino students or Raza. Con they're concentrated in two-year community colleges with low transfer rates, low representation in four universities. They often experience unwelcome envi unwelcoming environments in historically white universities. All these things that my colleagues write about, about students of color in white institutions, this is why, right? Because they continue to experience this these colonized um, ways of being. So that's what I argue in the, in the article. Um, so coloniality. I talk about coloniality of power um, in the article being like similar to like white supremacy, right? That it's a system, right? And so when I talk about decolonization, I'm not talking about it from like a really legal perspective is that like actually we give land back to indigenous folks, right? Like that's the that's at the bottom line. If we we're really gonna decolonize, that I mean like we gotta all, we all have to leave, right? Unless you're native, who's native? Anybody right native to the US, US lands, Native American. All right, so most of us aren't, because like I said, most Native Americans were wiped out, right? Colonization. Um, unless you are Native to this land and you date back that far back, we all got to leave. That would be decolonization, right? That's kind of probably never going to happen, right? We know that. So I talk about it from this systemic level, right? That the coloniality of power operates within our systems, right? And I talk about the curriculum because it's such an important tool. And we have the power to change the tool, right? The curriculum and the structures of the university. So we have to think about it like that, right? Like not racism, we think about white supremacy, right? It's the same thing. We talk, we think about coloniality of power as a system, right? And how do we attack the system and not the people, right? The people. I always have to talk about racism at a system level so that white people don't like boo me out of the room. I'm like, oh, no, nobody ever wants to talk about racism. I'm like, not talking about you as a racist. I'm talking about the system as a racist, right? The entire system is racist and we all uphold it, right? And the same thing, we uphold it, this coloniality of power. So go ahead and move on. I think you can move on to the next slide. Go to the next one. All right, so decolonizing HSIs, the framework. All right, so I'm an organizational theorist, and so I think about entire organizations. And organizational theorists like models, all right? So organizational theorists, they write, they develop these models. Right? They propose these like models, and they always have between like six and 10 um, aspects of the model, right? And so I looked at all these models, and I was like, oh, I don't like all these models because they don't take that racial lens, right? And they don't take this coloniality of power lens. So they're not recognizing that the folks in, in institutions institutions of higher ed that enroll large percentages of students of color ha have to take those things into consideration, right? And so I propose this model, and those of you that read the article know it's like a utopia, right? Like my graduate student read it, and she was like, oh, sign me up. How can I go to this institution? I'm like, I know, right? It would be so great if this actually happened. So it's a utopia. It doesn't actually exist, but I think it can, right? But we have to start to like deconstruct, right? We deconstruct the entire organization, right? One element at a time, right? But we have to understand that the coloniality of power and the white supremacy is operating, right, and within every system, right? So if we understand that, then we can start to, to like attack each each aspect. So those are the nine aspects of the model. Um, and so when I was writing this, I went back to the typology, right? And I was like, well, those outcomes are sort of like the colonized outcomes. Writing about decolonization is really hard. Let me tell you, because I keep having to like check myself. No, la Latino, I can't use that word, right? Like these outcomes that I'm talking about are colonial outcome, right? Like all of this is like, we all buy into it. We all buy into it. Just like people of color buy into white supremacy, right? We buy into racism all the time and we support it and uphold it. Women uphold patriarchy. I mean, gay people uphold heterosexism, right? Like all that, We're heteronormativity, we, we all reinforce those things, right? And so I had to rethink like, gosh, these outcomes are not gonna work with the model, right? And so I had to try to break down these, these, these um, ideas. So I was like, okay, enrolling a mix of racial, ethnic, cultural students, okay. But I, I expanded into like beyond students, right, in, in the model. Um, thinking about serving, I thought, well, maybe a Hispanic serving institution is liberating, right? That's, that would be, a, a, in this decolonized model, like it liberates people. It liberates all, right? It creates critically conscious folks that go out into the world and do good work and disrupt all the bad oppressive systems that are out there, right? It's liberating. We liberate ourselves um, and we liberate, you know, uh, the, from pa Paulo Freire perspective, the oppressor and the oppressed, right? Simultaneously liberating everybody, right? So that would be Hispanic serving to me. Um, I think about outcomes being beyond, like, 
your legitimized, what I call legitimized outcomes, right? That we think about how we teach our students to go out and to like serve their communities, right? We think about democratizing outcomes, right? We think about going out and being community, com engaged in your community, that that's a good outcome for students, right? We want students to do that. We don't want them to just get a degree. We want them to go out there and do good work in their communities, right? That That's a, that's this like decolonized um, sort of outcome, right? Environmental preservation, I talk about that. I'm like, wow, right? What if we just started in your, like food science, do y'all have a food sciences program? I love thinking about food sciences. Food sciences, I'm like, what if in food sciences, and even though you don't have it, because it's a good example, we taught students to grow their own food, right? I know, I'm like, we don't have one, we don't have one but if you did, right? Like, the urban farming is becoming a big thing, right? That's a decolonial, that's a decolonized ways of, way of thinking, right? That you produce your own food, you, 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 make your, you make your life sustainable for you and your family, right? That's a decolonized way of thinking, right? Environmental justice, I love environmental, um, engineers, right? I'm like, okay, how do you make this a justice for justice, right? Justice for all. How do you disrupt your curriculum and make it so that you think about that, right? So rethinking your outcomes from different perspectives. Um, and then, yeah, you can go on. Um, so there's nine pieces of the model, and I'll just go through them quickly. There's the elements. I don't even know if you can see them. The words are so small. Um, but the first piece is your mission. So rethinking your mission, that your mission is to decolonize, right? Your mission is to be anti-racist, anti-oppressive, anti-patriarchal, anti-heteronormative, right? All those sort of things. You're anti all of those things, right? That would be your mission, right? So diversity, I'm not down with diversity anymore. I'm not. Diversity, like people are like, oh yeah, diversity of thought. No, that's not, no, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about being anti-oppressive, right? Because institutions, we've worn out diversity. Yeah, y'all are diverse, look at the room. D diversity, check, all right? So you can't stop there. Diversity, you check the box. Y'all are diverse, I can see it right here, right? You're diverse, now how do you make yourself anti-oppressive? Stop celebrating diversity and start being anti-oppressive, right? That looks very different, because first of all, you have to admit that you're being oppressive, right? And that's hard for people to do. So you gotta start there, right? So no more diversity. Your mission is not to be diverse, your mission is to disrupt systems of oppression. All right, that's the mission. Purpose, all right, so your purpose, this is where you get into the outcome. So I always talk about, see, critical consciousness up there. I always talk about critical consciousness. Don't we want everybody to go out in the world and be critical conscious? Yes, right? That should be an outcome, right? How do we do that? I don't know, you gotta start thinking about that. How are your curricular and co-curricular structures designed to do that? Right? How are they designed to, to help your students to be good citizens, right? But good citizens in a way that go out and disrupt systems of oppression, right? Or coloniality of power. Uh, membership. Your membership, you've got to think about your faculty, your students, your graduate students, and your alumni base. Uh, i got to write about alumni base. Nobody writes about alumni base from HSIs. Al your alumni are super important. How do you gauge them? How do you bring them back into the mix and get them thinking about this, right? And, and also, those are people that, like, you know, they they, they're engaged, they give donations, all those sort of things, and we just stop thinking about them. Your community, how do you get your community involved in this decolonial um, idea, right? Your surrounding community has to be involved in that too. Your board of trustees, guess what? Board of trustees have to be on board with being anti-oppressive. That's probably the hardest group to get on board, right? But your board of trustees has got to be down with it too. So like every single person that has any say in this institution has to be down with it. They, everybody has to be down with being this, like, disrupting this coloniality of power. All right, so that's membership. Uh, what else do we got here in the model? There's four or six more. How much time do we have? I'm almost out. Tell me when I'm almost out. I'm good? Okay. Can you click? I don't know what comes next. Oh, governance. Oh, governance is tricky. This was hard to write about. Y'all laugh. You know who laughed? Faculty. Faculty laugh because university, colleges and universities were like, we were designed under this faculty governance structure that like faculty govern the university and colleges. And then, I don't know, at some point, this wave came in of administrators, right? And administrators came in and told faculty what to do. And faculty have never liked that, right? So we're not really sure who governs us, right? Because faculty are like, we govern ourselves. Administrators are like, we govern you. You should listen to us, right? And like, nobody knows who's governing anybody, all right? That's colleges and universities, right? It's this complex. So governance, I was like, oh, this one's hard, but we gotta attack it. 
We gotta decide who's governing who, right? And from a decolonized perspective, we should all be governing each other, right? It should be a communal thing. If we're really from this like indigenous way of knowing, it's everybody governs, including students, right? I go to H, um, I, I, it appears, I don't know, it appears there's students in the room. If you're a student, raise your hand. Okay, great, I love that there's students in the room, all right? Because I go give talks at HSIs and it's just administrators and faculty, and I never get to talk to students, and I'm like, why aren't your students involved? Why aren't your students decolonizing the HSI, right? Like they could give you really transformative ways of thinking, right? You wanna know how to serve students? Ask them. <laughs> Such a crazy concept. I know it's so absurd, right? Like why would we ask them? Ask them. Students are super innovative and they think differently, right? Than like you thought when you were in college like 20 years ago, right? Like we all, we, we gotta involve students in this conversation, right? So governance should include all members of the community, right? And that's what I talk about as far as the governance structure is like disrupting the traditional ways of governing institutions of higher ed, which is really hierarchical, right? That's not a, that's not a like a decolonized way of thinking at all, right? Structures are not, not, not cool. So figuring that one out is, is gonna be a hard one, but that's governance governance, community standards, this is what I, I call community standards, but this is like your policies and procedures and things that prevent students from graduating because that's a thing. We have these really funky policies in institutions of higher ed that like you can't get your financial aid unless you like check this one box, but you don't know that you had to check the one box because there's a really long line at the financial aid office and nobody told you and then you don't get your finance. I always pick on financial aid on that one, but policies, policies keep people from like doing things, right? Test scores, ooh, test scores, right? You gotta have a certain test score. You gotta have GRE to get into the graduate program or whatever it may be. You can disrupt those, right? Particularly if you know if they're oppressive. Right, we know policies are oppressive, right? Policies are not good for everybody. Do a policy analysis, you will find that certain groups benefit from policies and others don't. That's what policies are designed to do. They're designed to work for some folks and not others, right? So if you start to look at all your policies, you will find places where they're completely oppressive against certain groups, right? So that's what that really gets at is policies. Your policies and your rules for organizing the, or, you know, organizing a, a, on campus. You gotta think about them, you gotta think about how they're keeping people out or keeping them from getting out, from graduating, right? Justice and accountability. I like to think about this one because this one is like, I don't think we think about this at all. And it's funny because when I give talks to just faculty and, and administrators, they're like, oh, we need, we need um, restorative justice circles. I don't know if y'all know restorative justice circles, but this comes out of the urban ed literature that like um, black and brown kids get disciplined at higher rates. It's been documented, right? We know this. Black and brown kids, they get disciplined for being too loud, right? Like it, things that are like, that's subjective, right? You're too loud and they get suspended, right? So, and that's been documented, that there's really subjective ways of being, that's what students get documented for, right? It's racist, right? And we know that. So they've implemented these restorative justice circles where if somebody like hurts the community, we all come together and we talk about it. You don't kick the person out, right? Because they're a valuable person in the community. And so I presented this model and faculty and staff are like, we need justice circles, right? Because we fight, right? And we do, faculty and administrators fight, right? But students need to too, right? Like how do we hold each other accountable for continuing to support the mission, which if our mission is related to this model, this idea of being anti-oppressive or decolonizing, right? How do we get everybody on board with that, right? I write about racist incidents on college campuses and I think, gosh, how amazing. What if we had the students in the white fraternity who were singing the song about never having an N-word in their fraternity, what if we got them together and we had them in restorative justice circles with the black students on campus, right? But we don't. What do we do? And I don't know if y'all know that example that I'm talking about, but when that happened at the University of Oklahoma, it's like, hire a diversity officer and hire a diversity officer for every college and like do everything that publicly we look like we're gonna be you know, welcoming. And it's like, but what happened to the students? Did they get punished? Did the black students get to talk to those students? Did they, was there any sort of conversation going on about why it's not good to use the N-word when you're a white person, right? Maybe those white people don't even know. I mean, I hope they know that's bad, but I've found students that have told me they don't even know the significance of blackface. White students tell me that. I'm like, so you don't think it's bad to paint yourself black? The system has failed you. Colonial education. Because you don't even understand the historical implications of blackface to know that it's bad to do that. But people paint themselves black all the time. All the time, I've documented it on college campuses, white students, I'm like gosh, right? So that's where I really came from with this justice accountability, holding a community accountable when you do things that are wrong, like racist stuff. 
because racist stuff happens all the time. Oppressive stuff happens all the time. How do you hold people accountable, right? All right, last parts of it, technology. Technology is not actually technology, like as in computers and stuff, but like the curriculum and co-curricular experiences. That's how I usually think about this um, aspect because this is a very organizational way of thinking. And that technology is like what helps your inputs go into outputs. And on a college and university campus, it's your curriculum and your co-curricular experiences. So how do you get all those experiences behind this idea of decolonization, right? And I've talked a lot about uh, curriculum already, so definitely something you gotta think about. Incentive structure, this is for all the administrators in the room, raise your hand. If you're a department chair or above, raise your hand. Okay, y'all listen up. So if you don't encourage people to be anti-racist and anti-oppressive, they're not going to be, all right? So that's incentive structure. I talk about like, Promotion and tenure, let's say for faculty, right? Promotion and tenure, if it doesn't tell me that I have to be anti-racist in my promotion and tenure package, then I'm gonna be racist. <laughs> Seriously, right? You gotta say it, like it has to be that clear, right? Again, and not diversity. You should celebrate diversity in your classroom. No, you should not be racist in your classroom. You should not use the word alien instead of undocumented, right? Like stuff like that matters. It's oppressive and it's bad for people in you know, classrooms, people should be held accountable for their actions, all right? So the incentive structures, all y'all folks that have the power to think about how you incentivize people, this needs to happen. We have to incentivize people to, to, to decolonize the institution, right? We have to. So incentive structure, that one's tricky. Again, when you figure that one out, let me know. Idealistic, y'all. I haven't seen it happen. I'm just saying this is what needs to happen. All right. Boundary management is working with your outside organization, right? Like understanding that an HSI is a community organization, right? You should be committed to your community because your community looks like your students, right? So you should be serving your community because this is where your students come from, right? So you should be committed to them and committed to working with communities and not on them or for them, right? Like you're working side by side with communities, right? So that's really what the boundary management is, working with your community. So that's the nine elements of the model. How much time do I have? I got a couple more slides only. I have a couple more minutes. Okay, I could breathe. They just keep talking. Uh, so John Jay College is an HSI. I didn't get into a lot of stuff here because this is where y'all need to like think about it, right? But I just had some couple things for y'all to think about, right? So go ahead and go here. So I liked that you had HSI in your strategic plan. That was impressive. A lot of HSIs don't have that. I was like, okay, so we want to deepen our commitment to diversity. Oh, not anymore, huh? You're gonna deepen your commitment to being anti-oppressive. <laughs> or anti-racist, okay, cool. By enhancing our identity as an Hispanic servant institution. Now everywhere diversity is anywhere, y'all gonna just, psh. Gina said don't celebrate diversity. And people get so mad, they're like, what, what do you mean stop celebrating diversity? I'm like, I mean don't make it so superficial, right? We like diversity, yes, but we need to not be racist, right? Or oppressive, so that's the bigger thing, right? So I like that, but let's go on. Let's see, let's look at your outcomes. Oh, I like this, this comes from the report um, from LLAS, is that how you call it? Latino and, yeah. Yes. I'm never going to get the acronym right. So Latin American and Latino Studies, um, they wrote this report. The faculty wrote this, um, this white paper. And this was interesting. Y'all are getting a lot of HSI grants, right? So that's good, right? Now, what's going on with those grant monies? I don't know, right? But you got you to gotta think about that, right? Like, what happens with these grant monies, right? Like, is it disrupting? Now, the federal government, I will call on the federal, the federal government has to, talk about incentive structure, the federal government has to incentivize and decolonization, right? The federal government has to encourage us to do the things I'm talking about, which they don't, right? They don't, and that's, that's important for us to think about, that people act the way we, like grants drive faculty, right? So we write grants so that the federal government will give them to us, right? So the federal government want, wants more STEM graduates, so we write STEM grants, right? They don't want critical consciousness, that definitely don't want that, especially this administration. They don't want anybody to be critically conscious, right? So you write that, they're not going to give it to you, right? So you got to think about that also, right? It's like, how are we, how can we become a decolonized HSI when we're not being rewarded by the federal government to do that work, right? And so we got to be a little bit creative in that. Like, how do we do these things Gina's, Gina's talking about within our grants if that's not what the federal government wants, right? But you can. I think you could be creative in it, right? And still fit within, within it. But this is important. Y'all are an HSI. You're getting money, but what are you doing with it? I want to know that. That would be the next conference. That's the next time I visit. All right, next, what else is here? Y'all can tell me all about it. Um, 
there's your enrollment. Latinx students, 47%. Like, way just blows everybody else out of the water. But also, look at your black population, 70%. That's a lot for, for institutions. Besides HBCUs, most institutions have very small percentages of black students. Asian students is 10%, and your white students is 20%, right? So we already know. I saw it in the hall, right? We already know this is the case. This numbers aren't changing, right? You're going to have more and more and more and more people of color. And that's the reality. So this isn't going to go away, right? This is like something we got to deal with now. Go to the next one. What does the next one talk about? Uh, oh, that was interesting from the report that y'all have been in HSI since like 1984. Go back. <laughs> well, right around here, right, 1985 that y'all became. So y'all been doing this a while. You've been enrolling Hispanic students, but not necessarily serving them, right? And it's now 2018, and y'all are like, how do we serve them? Um, <laughs> Thanks for coming to the party, y'all. It's 2018, right? Y'all been doing this for like 20 years, right? Y'all should have figured it out. No, just kidding. Uh, it's, it's good. And nobody has figured it out yet. So y'all are with everybody else at the party late, all right? It's fine. Um, go, ahead, go ahead and go to the next one. So there's your six-year graduation rates. I think about six-year graduation rates. Although, this, click it one more time. I think six-year graduation rates, um, there's a couple things to think about. There's your national average, 59%. That includes the most elite institutions in the country. So it pulls up the average. Keep that in mind, right? Um, but y'all have a uh, y'all have a racial equity. Y'all have racial equity. That's what this means. That like you're almost e equitable across all groups. That's impressive. I don't see that very often. That's impressive. All right. So give yourself a hand for that. Give yourself a hand for that. You know why? Because that's not the case. Usually Latino students at HSIs are graduating lower numbers than all your other racial groups. All right, so that's why it's impressive. Now, the numbers are still kind of a little bit low, right? Because they're not at the national average, right? So that's something for y'all to think about because you're still at 40, you know, 45, 46, 42%, right? So this is something usually most institutions are trying to get their average up, right? Your six-year graduation. Although you have a large percentage of transfer students and they're not captured in the six-year rates. So that's important because your numbers might actually look very different, right? Because if half of your students are transfer, half of your students aren't accounted for in those numbers, right? Which is why I don't love the numbers, right? So y'all got to figure out what numbers you're going to use to benchmark yourselves, right? Because it could look very different, and then I might have to take the clapping back because there might not be equity. equity. <laughs> It might be different, right? Then you can't apply for yourselves anymore. But right there, I was like, hey, this is impressive. Y'all are graduating your students in equal, pretty equal numbers, right? So that's a good thing. But you know, you got to figure out what you want to be and if you want to graduate students in different rates. All right, go on to the next one. Oh, there's your faculty. These are all the white faculty. In case you're wondering, see how it doesn't look equitable? Doesn't look equitable at all, right? It's like, right? There's your Latino faculty, right? And this is what? Administration, faculty, and staff, right? Like across, across, wait, yeah. Blue is administration, orange is faculty, and white is staff, right? So you, you got a, you got an issue to address, right? You got an issue to address, so address it. I'll just leave it at that, because I know y'all going to think about it. Go on to the next one. Um, this is some of the culture that was in the report. Thank you all for the report. I appreciated the report. Because um, you got to start to uh, figure out where are you offering like the cultural side, right? Um, and this is just, you know, I got a handful of things from the report. But there's a lot of work for y'all to do in thinking about how are we serving students with a, like a cultural lens or a racial lens or a decolonized lens, right? And where is that happening? And where is it not happening? And where can it start to happen, right? If you're going to address the culture part, you got to think about where where does it have to happen and where is it not currently happening? So I think that's the last slide, and then I'll take some questions. Is it? Yep. Last slide while I drink water. <laughs> Do you have time for questions? Yeah. Okay. If you want to ask a question, I don't know if you want to use this, but nobody ever wants to ask the question. Yeah, come on up. Are you going to yell? <laughs> I don't like the mic. Okay. No. Right. You don't have to. All right, you can like just it. ask me. All right. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank you for being here. Um, I think I was. Yo, I can't relate, but I had a question. I come there so many white people. Okay. So my question was, hi everybody. <laughs> I'm a little bit shy. Um, I was I was looking at the the map or the chart, um, uh -huh. and I was wondering how come there's so many white students. Is it because they're mixed, and and the population also was the what are six percent of black, and why is that? The question is, why are there so many white students? 
I don't know. Does anybody have an answer to that? I don't know why there's so many white students. Do y'all not have white students? Was that a lot? No. There's white students, but that seemed like a lot to you, 20%? You don't see any white students at all? <laughs> okay, I admit, I admit the hall, I didn't see any white students, but maybe I wasn't, maybe I just wasn't looking at for them, because I see a lot of white students at my own institution, so, yeah, but I admit, so I don't know, I don't know, anybody have any thoughts on that? Is the 20% accurate? Do we think, yeah, all right, here, they have some answers, so, uh, so probably the number is all students, so graduate students, and graduate students at John Jay are much whiter than uh, undergraduates, so whatever number you're seeing that's that high, yeah. It was, it was undergrad? Yeah. Yeah, about 25%. So yeah, they're here. You just don't see them because they're like minority. <laughs> <laughs> they're different shades of white. <laughs> right. I could tell you why there's a lot of white faculty, though. <laughs> Racism. OK, that's an easy one. That's an easy one. Phew. Racism. So many layers of racism keep faculty of color from ever getting into faculty positions. So you got to disrupt that if you want to, um, you know, diversify your faculty. Actually, I don't need a mic either. I can be loud. But so the question I have is, what should our next step be? I mean, I, you, you know, you have this utopia. If we want to move towards a utopia, what's our next step? Yeah. Um, ooh, there's a lot of steps, right? So the aspects of the model that I talk about, I think there's a lot of pieces for you to address, right? Um, what we've been talking about today, like before this session, was like curricular structures, right? So I think faculty need to like spend, and like all faculty, right, need to spend some time thinking about how do we how do we change our curricular structures, right, so that students actually see themselves in the curriculum, and so that we're actually teaching these principles around equity and justice. I love that y'all have this mission of justice, right? Criminal justice, okay, I get it, but also like it's still in your title, right? Like I'm like, okay, I understand historically where that comes from, but you have the, the ability to be like, we are about equity and justice for all, right? Like what if that was our mission, right? John Jay, equity and justice for all, right? John Jay College is about equity and justice for all, right? Um, good, good, that's what it should be, right? But does it come across in the curriculum, right? Does it come across in your classroom, right? Your faculty, I mentioned in the last session, y'all need to start doing some cluster hiring. You wanna answer? Cluster hire, cluster hire. All right, cluster hiring is a is a good way to bring in faculty of color, and it needs to be a cross disciplinary cluster hire. Right. So cluster hire. Those of you that don't know what that means, that means you bring in a, like a group of faculty all together at one time, and they're all hired under one one swoop. Right. And it is a cross disciplines. Right. That like we're all on board that we're going to hire folks of color. Right. Minoritized people all in one swoop, right? a group of them. So it might be like five to 10 faculty that you hire across the whole college, right? And that it's very much focused on diversifying your faculty, right? And they know each other. They might know each other and they, they connect you with other people. Believe me, uh, faculty, we know minoritized faculty, right? We know people that want jobs, right? That don't have jobs. We can help to recruit, use us to help to recruit. So I would say cluster hiring is a really good approach y'all could take, right? Start to think about how you grow your own, right? Your graduate population, start to look at your graduate population, right? How do you get um, your administration? diversify your administrators, students who are here now will become your future administrators, right? I'm a student affairs person, I know this. Student affairs folks come up from your, your students, right? Students who all of a sudden realize they wanna be in college forever, right? <laughs> Those of you that are in student affairs know that, right? You're like, oh my God, I can be a resident director, yes! I can live for free in the residence hall, sign me up, right? We do that, right? Student affairs folks do that. So, and then you get to be in university and college settings forever, and it's great, right? So they come right up from your ranks, right? Start to grow your own, but be intentional about that, right? Start to groom them and be, groom them to be your future leaders, right? Because they are, they're gonna be your future leaders. So think about that. So yeah, diversifying, I think you gotta, you gotta spend some time with, right? Your, your faculty and your staff, really, and your graduate population, right? Probably need to think about that. What else next step? I think this is great. I love that y'all are all here, right? That you're thinking about it. Um, ask your students. Have your students do, um, I love the idea of participatory action research. There's a bunch of students in this room. Have them do some, have them, ask them, right? Have them go out, task them with going out and asking other students what they need to feel like they belong here, what they want, so that when they leave here, they have had the experience that they want to have had, right? Engage them, engage students in the process. You need to engage them, engage your alumni, engage your community partners outside to do this work. Um, so yeah, those are some that off the top of my head based on the conversations I've had today. Things that you can do, right? Those are all like, you could do all those things within the next couple years. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate what you had to say about diversity. But there's uh, another 
catchphrase or word that comes up oftentimes um, on how faculty address these, these questions. And it, it boils down to the word Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you speak to that issue? Yeah. So yes. Okay. So I'm gonna. I am gonna say. Actually, I stopped using the word colorblind because um, I was called out by a reviewer in a journal article that that was um, ableist term. I was like, wow. But like Eduardo Bonilla Silva says it right, and he is like magic in sociology. Right. If you don't know his work, you should read it. Um, he talks about race, racist without racism without racists. Right. This idea that that nobody will admit they're racist. Like if I said, who's racist in the room? Nobody's gonna raise their hand. But ra yet racism continues to exist, right? And so we're like, well, this is a conundrum, right? Because we can't address something that we don't want to admit. So so he writes about that, right? And writes about colorblindness, right? So anyways, now I just say color neutral, right? Because um, I was like, well, I guess it is ableist, an ableist term, right? So color neutral or this idea that we don't take race into consideration, right? Let's just call it that, right? Um, now, I I think that, that definitely that's, the, that's a problem, right? I worked with this institution, and they were an, a Latinx producing institution. They were graduating students in like three to three and a half years. I mean, they were graduating students in equitable numbers, but they had no sort of lens for Latinos or for any students of color, right? None of the curriculum, none of the program services, the faculty were like 85% white. I mean, there was completely, complete neutrality when it came to race. And they were like, yeah, well, we serve all students well, and we, we just serve them the same. And I was like, yeah, that's problematic. And then when I talked to the students, they were like, well, I never thought about it, right? Because I just haven't had the opportunity to to have it, right? But if I did, I would love it, right? Yeah, I would love to take a class that was like from a Latino perspective, right? I would love to have a student organization that I got to feel like I belong there, right? They wanted it, the students wanted it, but the administration was like, oh, we serve everybody well. We're doing a good job, Gina, right? Like we're graduating students and I'm like, yeah, but I mean students, they, they, they need to see themselves, right? They need to see themselves on a college campus, right? They need to understand that this is for them if it's actually a Hispanic serving institution. So yeah, I think we cannot say that we're color blind or neutral or we don't see race because that's a lie. That's a lie, right? That That's absolutely not true. We see race. Race you cannot hide. People interact with people based on their race. People move to the side on the street, walking down the street when they see a black person, right? Like, I mean, we react to people based on the way they, they look, right? And that is true. That's truth, right? So if we say we're race blind or race neutral, we don't see color, that's a microaggressive, right? That's what, 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 what the term microaggression, that's one of the ways in which people are microaggressed. Oh, I don't see you. I don't see color. Really? Because then you don't see me. Because I am a person of color. So you don't see anything about me. I mean, I'm standing here, right? That is microaggressive, right? So we can't operate from that lens. Absolutely not. I think we have to take race into consideration and we have to recognize that's what this whole thing is about, right? We have to recognize race. We have to re recognize colonialism. We have to recognize patriarchy. We have to recognize all these systems in order to uh, function, right? To adequately serve folks from minoritized groups question the college has done a lot of work around implicit bias mm -hmm. and what are your thoughts about that hey. what, what is what should we be doing around Implicit bias. I think implicit bias. Yeah, there's that. That's that's our newest trend, right? We go through trends in higher ed. So implicit bias is one of the newer ones, right? With microaggressions, implicit bias. Those are all sort of where we're at, right? Um, and again, that's something that's psychologically been proven, right? That it's actually real, right? Implicit bias is real. People respond and react to people based on their implicit bias, right? That we all have biases, right? And it's connected to what I've been talking about, right? We've been trained that way. Society has trained us that way. Our curricular structures have trained us that way, right? To have biases against folks, right? So I think it's good work. Um, I don't know, is it working? Are people still biased? <laughs> <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, it is. Because it's totally 100% a thing. Like, it actually absolutely is real, right? We see it happen all the time. That's why black people are killed at much higher rates by, at the hands of police than any other group, right? Implicit bias, right? That's implicit bias right there, right? So we know this is a real thing, and it has real implications. People are dying because of it, right? Your students aren't graduating, but people are dying, right, out in the streets because of it, because of implicit bias. So yeah, we know it's real. So yeah, I say do it. But training is like with anything. Like it, one time is not going to do it, right? You got to do it like multiple, multiple times. Did somebody cut me off? <laughs> it went off, huh? <laughs> oh, see, they cut me off. Hello, you had the next question. Go ahead. So a faculty member spends 10 to 12 years immersed themselves in a, quote, colonial body of knowledge. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. They get their PhD, their promotion, oh. their publication. Oh. And then along you come and say, you got to learn a new curriculum. Yeah. So what are the incentives, what's been your experience of how people make that meaningful shift? And it is that's, painful, that's a, a oh, that's on, huh? we should be learning. Yeah. Yeah, that is, all, that is a, such a good question. So y'all hear, hear that? That like, that like you've been trained by the colonial curriculum your whole career and you've been rewarded. So the incentive structure is important, right? I always say I will get promoted and I will get tenure it, the whiter I act, right? The more white I am, the more I do things that white male perspectives like the, that the university upholds, the more I do that, the more likely I am to be promoted and rewarded, right? Because that's what we get rewarded for, right? So you move up through your curricular, uh, you know, your, your, your career based on colonial knowledge, right? And now I'm saying stop that, right? So what, what that's the question, right? Like, Gina, who do you think you are, right? That's, that's, that's. I'm not saying to throw it all out, right? But recognize it, right? And to start to make, like, figure out, huh, how have I been upholding coloniality of power all these years, right? I don't think it's ever too late to learn, right, or to disrupt. Right, so once you become aware of it, then you can work towards it, right? But I, I understand that there's also that found, some, some fields like that's the, I mean, that's the, I mean, all fields, that's the foundation of knowledge, right? So I'm not saying just throw out all the knowledge, right? Don't throw it completely out, but like start to shift, right? So that students aren't just getting that body of knowledge, right? What are the other bodies of knowledge that, are, that can talk and also critique, right? Because people have critiqued, right? That's the good thing is we're at a point where in most fields, people have critiqued that body of knowledge already, right? Most fields you can find some folks that have criticized it. So, oh, it's gonna be hard, right? But I, th I think you could do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, over here. He took my question. That was your question, yeah, all right. But I wanted a more, con I guess a concrete. Concrete, I don't know that I have a concrete. Well, in, in your experience doing mm -hmm. with other institutions, are there institutions already doing this? No. no, that's what I said, if y'all, that's what I was gonna say, if y'all do any of this, you're gonna be the pioneer. Nobody's doing this. I just go around the country telling people to do it, but they, I'm not saying they're gonna do it. I'm waiting for it to happen, but it's gonna take like 20 years, right? Like it's gonna take a while till we see this sort of shift. This doesn't happen overnight, right? I think that's the reality is you have to also understand this doesn't happen overnight, right? It's gonna take some time, but it doesn't mean it's not worth it, right? I love Derek Bell and I'll finish with Derek Bell. Derek Bell, racial realism, talk, basically talks about that, right? That he's never, he, Derek Bell said he was never gonna see racism end, but doesn't mean he wasn't worth fighting for. Right, so we do this work and we fight for justice even if we know we're not gonna see it in our lifetime, right? We still do it, doesn't mean you shouldn't do it just because you're not gonna see the outcome, you should still do it, right? You should, st should still do the work and believe that it's important work. So I will end with that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gina Garcia, thank you.